I will begin with a, some kind of general, let's say general introduction to outline a little bit of uh, development uh, in the field of contemporary dance in what is now called the Republic of Slovenia. But you have, <coughs> and I said, that I somehow put the periodization on the, in the title 1899, and I think I will jump a little bit uh, to the 60s, 70s. Uh, and let's say we have the more or less very, very uh, uh, similar situation everywhere in Europe before the war. Um, I now managed to kind of more precisely study the criticism and writing on dance before the war, and it's obviously this kind of, uh, before the Second World War, very creative chaos in the field of uh, contemporary dance. So it, there is no very precise distinction between ballet and uh, contemporary dance or modern dance at the time. They use different kind of terms to define what they do on the stage. And there are some artists who don't even consider they could, uh, didn't even consider themselves as artists, they just did dance. Mostly they were female and so on. Uh, but after the Second World War, I mean, there are a lot of different connections before the, the First World War. We hear, see here um, Ruth Vaupotich, who performed in, uh, in Paris as a modern dancer, ballet dancer, but also in Ljubljana. Most of modern dance before the world happened in the opera house, which is also very interesting. So mm, here, here is a constructivist magazine from 1927 called Tank, uh, published in Ljubljana. And here we have, uh, here we have two dancers from the opera that performed in Paris at the, with the, uh, Enrico Brampolini, the theater of futuristic pantomime, basically the, the opening event of the futuristic theater in 27. And Lydia, Lydia Viziak and Václav Velček were part of that, and the Slovenian magazine Tank published the, also the reviews, you see. But I will go very quickly through this period. This is for, this is from the um, Pia and Pino Vlaka were two choreographers that worked in Ljubljana and also after the Second World War in Opera House. And <coughs> the um, Pia Scholz Mlaka was German and Pino Vlaka were was uh, Slovene. They met in Laban School before the war, and then they basically were very important figures in what they want to establish after the Second World War, which would be something that they would call Yugoslavian ballet in connection to the Ballet Russe, and it would be a mix of basically different forms from ballet to modernism. And I will show you later on one uh, one ex uh, one fragment that we have that American television recorded in 1955 in Zagreb, the staging of the the, the the choreography that we see here, David in the village. This is these are pictures from the. It was premiered in Zurich in 1935, and this is this kind of ethno choreological moment that was very popular in, um, in Europe, all over Europe, from Ballet Russe to, to different companies. And they would do a little bit of folk dances. Uh, or they would basically transform folk dances in what Mlaka would call the modern form. So basically, folk dances couldn't stay as folk dances in the performances. They supposed to be physically transformed into something that would suit this ethno choreological moment in their works, uh, and this would be basically modernistic kind of uh, dance. It would, the, the basically ballet 
uh, ballet vocabulary wouldn't be suitable for the representation of folk dances on the stage. It would, it would have to be modernized. Mm. This is Katja Delag, the Austrian choreographer and dancer who worked here in Ljubljana from 31 till 38. She was from the Jewish family from Vienna and later in 38 emigrated to the United States and was with his friend Fritz Berg very crucial for um, or she would, they would teach something that would be uh, in the 47 called Palestinian dances in the United States and two years after they would basically call this Israeli dances already. So they would teach these four dances and also modernized form of it in New York and around. The, the cultural center 92nd Street Y in New York would be basically a certain kind of a center for their work. It's on the 92nd Street. This is Katia Dela. This is the school of Meta Wittmer before the war. Uh, in uh, Ljubljana. She was the student of Mary Whitman's school, so she established in 29 in Ljubljana. It's a school which was quite influential uh, also for the development of contemporary dance after the war. Here, here are some examples. This is Pia Mlakar, this is Pino Mlakar, part of this is Václav Vrček, the one who danced with Trampolini, with Trampolini in um, in uh, Paris. This is the picture of Slovenian dancer Marta Paulin Brina dancing in front of the Yugoslav Partisan, Partisan Army in September 43. Uh, the soldiers are, were just liberated from the concentration camp in Raab after capitulation of Italy and she is dancing. She was the the student of Mary Wigman, not of uh, Meta Wigman, who was the student of Mary Wigman, and uh, she's performing here, yeah, in the in totally different conditions in which she used to perform. And she, in her memory, she says that uh, basically she had to forget everything that she learned. She had to face the dance on the uneven ground. And she would face the audience that not, not that they wouldn't see dance. Some of them never basically saw any cultural event until then. With the cultural group of art and division, she would perform in the disliberated territories in Slovenia in front of these audiences that were just totally virgin audience. Uh, watching dance and the, the memoirs, in the memoirs they're telling how impressed they were and how, how thick the atmosphere was and how enthusiastic the audience was when she was performing. And this, this is for me a very interesting thing because nowadays that we are talking about audience developments all the time. It's a one, <laughs> one example of how <clears throat> kind of very special social or political circumstances produce or open the kind of sensibility of the people uh, to the point that they're able to perceive something that they wouldn't know before. And um, <clears throat> Marta Pauline Pina, I mean, her story, I mean, she, she, it's, uh, it's interesting also uh, also because now she is basically in the uniform wearing the, uh, the wearing these shoes that she got from one dead Italian soldier um, because they reused the, what they found all the time but these shoes, these boots were kind of fatal for her because when they when the Fartin Division marched during the winter time of 43 to 44 uh, through what from one part of Slovenia to the other, and there was a huge amount of snow that year. Um, a lot of them were killed on the way. 
but uh, her toes frozen, so basically they had to remove the toes, and uh, so that was the end of her dancing career. She was the pedagogue after the Second World War, and uh, she died in, I think, 2005. And she's this kind of uh, legendary figure. This, I mean, <clears throat> it's one of the rare examples of basically contemporary dance in, the, in this kind of circumstances. I think in Croatia they, they had one ballet dancer who was also performing in front of the partisan army. This is, this is a special example of contemporary dance at the time. And it's, a, it's a also, I don't know, I mean it's, it's also interesting because basically she was trained in something that used to be considered as the German dance in front of the uh, partisans. There were no limits. I mean, yeah, no, no, but, 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 but the choreographers uh, of Ausdruck times would consider them themselves as a German kind of dance, but this basically saw no limits. But all, no. Here in Pina Laka were uh, artistic directors of the Bayerische Staatsballet, I don't know, precisely how it was called, between 39 and 43, basically in the period of February, then they realized that Pino Macher is slavery, so they had a problem, so they basically... <clears throat> this was the end of his artistic directorship in the, uh, in the ballet, and after the Second World War, they performed, this is in 45, they performed their duet, the ballet, for the American soldiers uh, in, 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 in Munich. So this, this is one, this, this is from the period when they um, were the directors of the opera house, the ballet company was Ljubljana Opera House uh, between 45 and 1960. And they, and this is, what is interesting is that basically this repertoire that they programmed was the mixture of everything. It was quite modernistic, I would say. Uh, also the ballet ensemble wasn't able to dance anything that was part of the canon at the time. So they would, uh, they would, they would produce a huge amount of works in Ljubljana and all over the Yugoslavia, and uh, it was kind of a lot of this kind of, uh, mm, let's say, uh, contemporary realism in, in dance, which is very interesting. Uh, this is the bow, the duet, the dimension that they performed in front of the uh, American soldiers in 45. It was just a restage a few years ago in Opera House in Ljubljana. Now I will basically make a little bit of tribute to the place and London Contemporary Dance Theatre because in the from the beginning of the school on, from April 60, uh, 65 till uh, 70, she was the student, uh, Xenia Hilbert, a Slovenian dancer, was a student of the school at the beginning, and then from 67 till 74, she was part of the, the company. Before, in the 1960s, uh, so here we see her on the photo with the at the beginning of the 60s with uh, Margot Fontaine because she, she was, uh, Xenia basically studied from 60 to 62 at the Rambert Dance School and then back, went back home and then later in 65 came to London and stayed with the school and the company till 74. Just, uh, mm -hmm. This is also with, uh, this is Xenia here and uh, Fontaine on the other side. Basically, this, basically, all these photos were taken by one guy who wrote the dictionary of Ballet, Jimmy Wilson, 
Wilson was one very enthusiastic guy who grew out of the ballet context of Britain from the 20s on and was following dancers. He would take a lot of photos and they, they keep in the, I think, the, at the archives of the Royal Ballet the pictures that he took, of, that he, basically the, the photos that he would take of dancers in front of his rover. And basically he, was, he visited Ksenia Hriba in 65 in Slovenia and told her that the Graham School is opening in London and in one month she was already there. This is one concerning international collaborations exchange <laughs> and, uh, and cultural diplomacy. What, it's a very interesting thing. Camargo is the one of the first ships that uh, one guy called Julius Fleischmann Jr. was he was cruising throughout the world with these ships to a cultural anthropologist and a very, very wealthy man who was the heir of the huge um, network of factories called Fleischmann Yeast. It was Fleischmann. Um, fly, they, they would produce a yeast and earn a huge amount of money uh, already in the second half of the 19th century. But he was also <coughs> culturally very active. He was the, uh, at one point, artistic director of the Palais de Monte Carlo and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. He would invest a huge amount of money in, uh, in art. And um, here in 63, Ksenia is on this ship with this guy. He was cruising throughout Europe uh, and uh, chasing young, young artists to kind of mm, and try to, and especially, he was especially interested in those who were behind the, what was called the Iron Curtain and try to uh, preach, of course, the freedom of speech, uh, liberal values, uh, to them and also he would to a certain extent help them and also in the financial way but what was interesting that in 1974 one american journalist found out that the mm, so-called eisenhower funds found uh, funds for for the for the uh, uh, export of american art to europe that basically all this money CIA basically channeled through his accounts. So basically all the dance companies that were in also in Yugoslavia from the 50s on, like Kozelimon Dance Company, Marta Grand Dance Company, they would be sponsored by this Eisenhower Fund but, but, but with the money that America would, would invest into ex exporting uh, modern dance to, to Europe. And I still can figure out how come that Xenia basically appeared on this ship. It's, well, it's kind of well or known that one friend of her who was a writer helped her uh, to get on this ship, which was parked at the Piran Gulf in, on the Slovenian beach in 63, in the summer of 63. And, uh, the whole story was told by Dusan Jovanovic, who also a Slovenian playwright, and who also kind of was on the way to 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 get on this ship. So, and this was the moment that Dusan Jovanovic get to know Ksenia Hriba, and she, he realized that she looked like some kind of a movie star on the on the ship. This is. Uh, in the first performance, the first season of uh, London Contemporary Dance Theatre in October 67. It was called Witness of Innocence and it was done by a Canadian choreographer David Earl. I mean, what I kind of, uh, because I just finished the book, what I realized and what we 
have to know uh, or what we find hard to imagine these days that basically America, that uh, the contemporary dance was very new in Europe after the war at the time. Basically, there was um, before we had some situations, so some small environments, some small circumstances in which contemporary dance would appear or in combination with the ballet. Because Europe had, had needed a, a huge amount of time to re-establish itself after the Second World War somehow to get alive again. And uh, London Contemporary Dance Theatre was one, but basically was the first real um, contemporary dance company with uh, such a, with a, with a, basically with a company structure. And what is also very interesting is, this was, we have to know, this was before the Pina Bausch got Wuppertal Tanz Theater. Basically nothing was, the context was really uh, very poor, except of course American dance companies would tour around. And uh, in, in, this, in this period, or in, in, with this company, it's interesting to see the, how wide the aesthetic range was. Basically, they, they, they did, did everything from a very kind of already canonized works of modern dance, like Graham, Anna Sokolo, Telly Pitti, to the most experimental works done by very young artists, or some invited artists like, uh, for example, Remy Charlie, who in 1972, did the first kind of postmodern piece, I claim, for the, in the British context, uh, in which they talked, uh, they, they would, um, the company would collect the task from the, the tasks from the audience and then execute them. They would paint on the floor with their bodies, then they would, they would sell the paintings for a very small amount of money. And John Percival, who was right, who was a renowned dance critic at the time, was very, very uh, uh, a little bit angry. And uh, basically, this kind of classical discussion about uh, identity of dance starts in the British media. So, what is dance and what is not dance? This is uh, then the big. Uh, thing. This is from 67, Witness of Innocence, also one tryout of the very early different kind of organization of the dance narratives, because basically what they knew at the time was mostly very dance dramas then done as in ballet. And here, David Earl, very young choreographer, had this idea that he would basically have this crucial figure of Jane Grey, who was dancing and played by Xenia, and all around he would, he would basically kind of deconstruct narration in the way that it would be very fragmentary organized. And this is, and, and when I was reading all these things uh, about this period, it's obviously that it's obvious that critics are really struggling with how to comprehend all, all this stuff. This was totally new. Although, I think they were very good in descriptions of things. Um, this, is, this is also Witness of Innocence. This is uh, from 68. Xenia performed in one of the projects of Primavera Bowman. Uh, there were five pieces called Five Situation, and it would be the period when in London they would experiment with the mixed, something that they would call mixed media theater or mixed media dance. Mostly people who would create those, these works were, would be artists, visual artists, who would also be somehow involved in, the, in, uh, in dance and choreography. This is a great. With this work, Primavera Bowman graduated, and it was one of the first examples in, um, in England that they would experiment with the situations, which, is, which was the new term in visual arts, but also with sculptures. 
and it will be presented, I think, twice in the July of 68 in the Mermaid Theatre in London. And one year before, one of the pieces would be performed in some kind of hippie club called uh, the Electric Garden. Um, the, the, the other one was of Alan Pitti. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a kind of it, it's interesting example of how basically these were the sculptures that had to be kind of used with uh, choreographic proposals, where not just the object that one would look at, but basically they were functional and they had to be used in certain ways. A very similar thing that perhaps the postmodern dance at the time did in New York, but with a certain kind of technical uh, approach, uh, physical approach that was a little bit different. This is something that I use with the permission of uh, the Primavera Bone. This is, per perhaps you would find this a little bit unusual. This is the, in, in May of 69, the, London was, or Britain, Britain was already in war, uh, one year in kind of a xenophobic uh, period, and also some kind of racist things, things started to occur in the late 60s. And Xenia got the, basically, I think from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, she got informed that she had, has to move out of London in one week. So uh, the, the, the Dance Trust organized for her a wedding and the marriage with a guy who was prepared to marry her in order to get a British citizenship. And this is, this is, uh, the, these are two pictures from this wedding, which is kind of very interesting situation because, I mean, contemporary dance is always connected with migrations and also work permissions and everything. So this is one of the very practical things, how they dealt with the fact that basically the whole company was very, very uh, multicultural, multinational. They came from all over Europe, South America, and uh, so this is uh, the wedding. This is the wedding picture, and uh, on the on the right is the choreographer Robert Cohen. This is one. This is from 1970. One piece of William Luther called "Divertisement in the Playground of, of the Zodiac." One piece that they performed also in Ljubljana which is uh, also interesting, kind of interesting episode is that uh, obviously you know, London Contemporary Dance Theatre had to tour. I guess they were wanted to convince Arts Council to give them a little bit more money, so they had to provide for themselves international tours. And uh, I think the only way to get the money from British Council at the time was to tour the, the let's say, the part of parts of Europe that they would be prepared to finance, and this was at the time Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. In the, the problem with Czechoslovakia was that in August of '68 they had this uh, invasion of Soviet soldiers and army in it, so it was very hard to organize. But Xenia invested a lot of, uh, let's say, the first negotiations with the different 
institutions in Slovenia and Belgrade to be able to or for, for the, the place and the dance trust to organize the first tour and the, the first tour was they, they went to Yugoslavia, Ljubljana, Zagreb, Umag, Split, Dubrovnik, Belgrade and then to Slovakia and then to Venice, in Venice, Venice, Italy. And it was, um, I mean, the whole correspondence with, uh, that I got, it's, uh, it shows, for example, the differences between different uh, institutions in Yugoslavia at the time, um, also the different kind of competitiveness between them, because they, it was a huge fight who will be in charge for the whole tour, Ljubljana or Belgrade, and at the end it was Ljubljana, but uh, yeah, and it was the, it was total improvisation, and I think this tour was total improvisation for the company and the, for the Yugoslavian context, and uh, the another one was in '73 with the South American uh, tour that happened just. Um, at the time when South America was just before different coup d'etats and you know, at the time when Peron returned from Spain and so on, it was huge, uh, um, yeah, it was quite uh, huge improvisation. This is also this is this is one backstage photo from the stages. Now, I, do, do I have 10 minutes more? Uh, I, will, I will now <coughs> show you some photos I, I mentioned before Remy Charlie's dance from 72. Remy Charlie was uh, a founding member of Merce Cunningham Dance Company from the 53 on. And this was kind of experimental work. But what is also interesting is uh, four or five works that <coughs> Robert Cohan uh, did at the time in London, which basically caused a huge or a little bit of a problem basically how to perceive them and he would call them as a, something, he would call them choreographic realism or something, basically kind of everyday reality that enters the stage and it, there were for the, one, the first was cell which kind of happened by itself um, and in all of these pieces Xenia of course performed this is one. Mm. Then the second one was something that he called X. The third was Mass, and in between two two pieces, one it was called People Alone and People Together, and both together were called People, and they they, they would perform them as a, as a whole. What is interesting is that basically this was as, as I said, it was a kind of virgin field also for the perception of dance at the time in Europe. They saw perhaps Graham, Paul Taylor, also Mars Cunningham, especially in England and France. They saw Andy Nicolai, they saw all these mod American modern dance groups who would usually deal with a certain kind of narrative in dance, but in a kind of classical way. Now, Robert Cohn here decided, especially in X and Mass, uh, really, it's, it's really interesting to read the reviews because the crit critics realize that they are seeing something that kind of have, has a coherence on stage, but they don't know how to grab this, what it was. What, and um, Cohen was uh, kind of interested in, let's say, social behavior, he would, for the people, he would give tasks for to the to, to the dancers to basically to propose the situation in which mm, they would uh, they would choreographically solve the situation of loneliness 
isolation and so on. In X and mass, he would connect groups, huge groups of people in the way that wouldn't suggest a lot of very direct signs, dramatic signs, theatrical signs. He would reduce the material to the physical actions themselves. And uh, it's, it's interesting because this is, this is something that, for example, in the last years, we are very fond of programming, let's say, certain kind of relation between, between choreographic and social composition. This kind of non very direct um, configuration of different, you know, different groups, groups of people that would suggest or develop certain kind of social behavior or development. I don't know, collective jumps that we had here of Isabel Schad and so on. So well, when I was reading the reviews, watching photos, I realized perhaps that, that some things happened a little bit too early for the... And also, if we think that Pina Bausch entered the Wuppertal Tanztheater in 73 and then managed till the end of 70s already, she was already touring with the company and she would basically stage this kind, exactly this kind of social behavior of people in the very communicative way. Also, Robert Cohen, at a certain point, he kind of, in some interviews, he said that perhaps he didn't know how to do it. But what is interesting, what is really, really interesting, when they were touring South America, which was politically from, in, this was uh, late April till early, till, uh, till late June 73, that was, for example, two months before coup d'etat in Chile, Peron in Argentina just came back from Spain, Paris won, it was totally unstable. But people responded to those pieces, like, you know, everything was clear. It was in this, yeah, in this, they recognized basically, they, would, they could invest in those, let's say, Configura choreographic configuration of social composition, a huge amount of different association, it was clear for them. While, for example, in Europe, this was a problem, not only in Britain, but also in Yugoslavia. In Split, one critic said that the only chore choreography which was really not good was X. Um, one of, basically one of these, let's say, yeah, and I will show you some photos. I, I managed to collect some photos from the archives in, in London, but I still find in different books um, photos that are just not there anymore. There is not a lot of photos with the groups on. This is Xenia and people. This is mass, the beginning of the mass with the lines. Uh, this is the end of it. Most basically, well, there is one critical role that there is no solo pieces in the in this in in, the, in mass, which was also collaboration with one uh, the Russian composer who did the score, and they were singing and dancing at the same time, which is also very interesting decision from for seventy year seventy three. Uh, this is it. This is basically it. Um, and to conclude with uh, the piece that I referred to before of Remy Charlie Dance, this is this improvisation experimental work with a lot of talking and with a lot of basically actions and tasks that they would execute on the stage and it wouldn't be very virtuosically done. And this is the moment when they are collecting proposals from audiences and then they would execute them. And they would have 
Of course, initial letters of their private names written on the costumes, which is also kind of dealing with the everyday reality. And they would feel exposed. They would feel very much exposed. And the, it was the, the whole piece that they would do would be very kind of horizontally structured uh, process. Yeah, this is, so this is, uh, this is, say back here. Yes. Perhaps you know, Linda Hughes and Robert Mark, I think. I, yeah, okay. I think we have to conclude. I gave you s a few fragments, a few stories. It's a huge amount of uh, material still. But I kind of selected these ones. I hope you, I mean, you enjoyed. Uh, just we had some technical problems. But I apologize.